Welcome back to the Renaissance. Uh, this is uh, our ongoing series on Leonardo da Vinci, but joined today uh, by a very special guest, one of the world's leading authorities on Leonardo da Vinci, Matthew Landris from Oxford University, supernumerary fellow at Wolfson College at the University of Oxford. I think that means he's a member of the Super Friends. Uh, University of Oxford, I think I've heard that before, heard of that before. Welcome to our little Leonardo show, Matthew. Well, thank you, uh, Cameron, for inviting me uh, to talk about my, I guess I could say my favorite subject, and, uh, and hope I can be of help with any of this. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm sure that uh, you know a thing or two uh, more than we do on the subject. Uh, but before we get into LDV, why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about yourself and uh, what a supernumerary fellow does and how you ended up devoting a large chunk of your life to Leonardo da Vinci? And judging from your accent, you're not from London originally. Maybe uh, where are you from? I'm, I'm from uh, the Midwest, uh, uh, from two places, from Maryland and Louisville, Kentucky. And, oh, wow. Uh, and uh, currently I, I spend most of my time teaching and reading essays, most, most, of, my, most of my work at the moment. But, uh, but for research, I've been working on uh, Leonardo's work just because it keeps drawing me back in, just because there's so much more to do, even if I think, no, no, I think, that's, I think I'm done now. Uh, and I've been doing that for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Uh, I started looking at his drawings and the preparatory marks and the drawings, the, the metal stylus marks. And, uh, and it, it just, the work led from there. I kept finding more things that hadn't been worked on. I, I, and I mainly work on connections between art and science, um, ways in which uh, visual artists have used um, what they've understood about science uh, of their time, especially in the early modern era. So, so that's that's my main interest, really, is how uh, Leonardo and others worked with the technical aspects of their of their um, projects, and then understood the natural history, natural science of their day um, in the process. So that's that's what I that that keeps bringing me back to him as a subject. It's like the old Michael Corleone thing, just when I thought I was out, Leonardo pulled you back in. Uh, well, let's, as you know, uh, in, in the series that Ray and I have been doing, which is part of our broader Renaissance series, I think we're about 12 episodes into Leonardo at the moment, and we've just gotten up to the point where he moves to Milan. Uh, so I do want to talk to you about that, but before we get into that, let's let's talk a little bit about, I guess, Leonardo and why he is so fascinating. Why you've devoted such a big chunk of your life to him, and why we're still talking about him five hundred odd years uh, later. You know what? What is it about Leonardo? I mean, he obviously he's probably the, if not one of the most famous artists who has ever lived but what is it about him that that keeps us coming back to da vinci i i, I would first think about the amount of material we have from him the the notes and drawings of about six thousand different pages and uh and what that material refers to in terms of his professional activities uh, his interests in understanding um, uh, all, I don't know, approaches to theories of everything, for example, and trying to understand how nature works. Um, so his genuine approaches to trying to understand uh, the world around us um, is part of what I think brings people back to his, um, to his approaches to natural philosophy. Um, that said, obviously, he's, he's an incredible um, painter, and uh, was also known as a sculptor. So, so there's, there's that aspect of the reception of his work that he's, that he's referred to um, as a visual artist primarily and was, was indeed in his own day uh, primarily considered a visual artist. So what, if, what keeps people interested in him as the so-called genius of his day 
when in fact a lot of his notes and drawings are his studies. You know, they are not only for him though, for for also his his studio assistants and for his uh, immediate circle um, that he's that he's sharing. It would seem, or at least preparing to share some of this information that he's obtained, and and um, while he's learning about um, engineering um, and uh, and physical sciences and um, and uh, mechanics, for example, uh, statics, which is the uh, science of weights, and dynamics, which is the science of, of things in motion, and um, and and so many other issues uh, related to how how uh, natural functions uh, develop in the paintings that he had done, as well as in other projects. So, as a professional, he was essentially a contractor. I mean, he set up uh, impressive projects for for uh, very wealthy individuals, um, uh, dukes and duchesses, and, um, and and you know and and, and lived like a lord most of his life. So how did that work? Uh, that's another interesting aspect. His professional life developed rather well. Um, it, not, that it, not that he knew at the outset that, that that's the direction it was going in. It's just that he, his work was so good, at, at, for example, in Milan. So as we talk about Milan, we'll come to these issues of, of, of what, how he really developed as a very interesting person uh, that we know today. The other day I was helping my uh, daughter who's in the ninth grade uh, with her pa paper. Um, she doesn't, you know, she's a typical ninth grader. She knows Michelangelo. She knows the name. She knows Leonardo. And she knows the one artist of the Renaissance that she was uh, assigned to study. And I'm wondering what, how would or why would a ninth grader who doesn't really pay attention to history or, or, or know anything about the Renaissance know the name Leonardo? I mean, does he get good press over the years? Is it because he's attached to the Renaissance? Yes, he did some paintings or whatever, but I'm trying to wonder how does the name Leonardo somehow filter through all the pop culture and everything else that my daughter either um, looks to or ignores completely? How does she know the name? Why, does, why, does, why are we still talking about him today? Is it just the paintings? Is, is it his notebooks? Is it the is it that he embodies something of the Renaissance where you can achieve anything? You just have to apply yourself. You have to be driven and to constantly think outside of the box. I'm just trying to wrap my head around. Why are we still talking about this guy? As impressed as we are, I'm just wondering, is it just because of what he embodies that makes him stand the test of time? I, I think so. Yes, I, indeed. The period between say the, the 1480s and early and early, say, 1503 to 4, um, is when he produced his best work that we, that we still refer to, you know, to some extent today. And uh, the Mona Lisa, The Last Supper, the, uh, um, some very famous pieces, and uh, had produced a, many of his notes by them as well that, that have made their way into popular culture. But the reception of Leonardo is, is very interesting in this, in this regard and something I've been working on recently um, because he's really an invented person um, for us. He's mm. not very much the same uh, for, for us as he, would, as he would have been in his own time. In fact, in his own time, there were many like him who were quite good at, at uh, and, and even quite accomplished in a number of, uh, of, of different areas and, as engineers and artists and, and, and other talents um, that we could refer to who um, were arguably more impressive than, than uh, Leonardo at the time. And my mm -hmm. students will bring that up every now and then. They'll say, well, I'm really surprised that he's just a normal guy. And I'm really, you know, for his own time. Um, but in the courtly, courtly environments that he, that he worked in, uh, there were incredible people uh, that we should also try to think about. But what happened in the meantime? Good question. Uh, various developments uh, with, for example, the restoration of the Last Supper, that, that would be a period in around, uh, around 1800, uh, around 1812, and then, uh, and then again, um, popularity in France, because he had, because he had retired in France, and uh, because, the, uh, because under um, Louis XIV, in fact, there was a medal made in his honor, um, and, uh, and, uh, and medals in, in the honor of, of, of other people, but the valuing of him in France, the, the way in which he's appreciated 
for his notes and drawings in England when they're collecting in England in the early 17th century and into the 17th century by the royal family and others. And then the Mona Lisa stolen in 1911. And we wonder, uh, uh, and, and, and people are thinking, what a great loss, of course. And, and she turns up in 1913 and, and all is well. But Mona Lisa mania develops from that. And there, and there's, and there are other interests, uh, especially among intellectual. There's a nationalistic, or I should say, there's a nationalist interest in Italy to promote geniuses like Leonardo and uh, Col Christopher Columbus and, right. and, uh, and Dante and all these others um, as a way of showing national pride. Uh, so how Leonardo has been um, praised over the years has a lot to do with how he's been used, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mean that in a weird, in a bad way, but how he's been used as, a, as an emblem, as, a, as emblematic of the, of the nation, of, of the people, of, of great painters, you know, and the Mona Lisa gets a great reputation, especially after it's after it had been stolen, and um, and so yes, why do, why is he now uh, a household name? Then can be answered in terms of it's a long answer, isn't it? In terms of of him having these talents in so many different areas and being praised for for that polymath ability he had over the years. How do you think he thought of himself? Did on his business card? What did he have on his business card? Leonardo da Vinci was it painter, uh, uh, sculptor, engineer, scientist, or did he just put Renaissance man on his business card and just hand that out to people? Right. Well, he did keep paintings. For example, he kept projects at hand, perhaps to show people. He had a model made for the Taburio, for example, of 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 the. Santa Maria della, uh, no, for the uh, for the Milan Cathedral, and and for uh, other other projects. So his business card happened to be these uh, examples of his work, including the notebooks that he had produced. So one thing he had written, he had, he had actually been advised by Ludovico Sforza when he arrived in Milan, supposedly advised anyway, to produce uh, a book on painting. And it seems he was also encouraged to produce a book on mechanics. And he and he's understood, and it's understood that in 1496, when Luca Pacioli refers to this, this is three or four years after Leonardo had written these two books, a book on, on painting and a book on mechanics, that we know um, uh, that's a, also his business card, you know, that that he he was known for these uh, for intellectual as well as visual and um, engineering and other projects. So what was on, what was his, um, the other, oh, the other business card, I should say, is the one that was given to him by way, by way of a passport. So on the passport, uh, uh, given to him by um, um, Cesare Borgia in 1502 to three, uh, when he was working with Cesare on, um, on uh, making maps and other studies of the, of some of the towns that uh, the Borgias had, had uh, uh, or that the pap uh, papal uh, army had taken over. Um, Leonardo was was given a passport, a, a document, a small document that said that he was the the engineer for for uh, Cesare Borgia and uh, and architect, and that anything he wanted, and he and he and his crew, as they arrived, uh, they should be given, or else they faced the wrath of, of Cesare. So. Interesting to think of business cards, but yes, he had them in various forms. So what, what was on them? Um, certainly uh, the Florentine painter is what he was called by the, by the Milanese and, uh, and then called uh, the sculptor for, uh, for Ludovico Sforza in 1489. He had that full-time job at that point. And then, uh, and then also worked as architect when he was sent off in 1490 just a year after, to work in, um, uh, on uh, other engineering and architecture projects. So, um, so yes, he had a lot of that as a reputation as, by the time he left Milan in 1500. So he's a bit like me. He walked around with several business cards, depending on who he was talking to. It could be 
podcaster, filmmaker, author, you know, just raconteur. So he just, he had a, like a little uh, file of business cards. He was a, but in all seriousness, he, like when we, we talked about the sort of job application that he wrote to Luke, Ludovico Sforza, um, which basically talked mostly about his engineering capabilities uh, and right at the end said, oh, by the way, I can paint and sculpt as good as anyone as well. It's like it's a bit of a throwaway, but obviously he was targeting that to where he thought the opportunities to make a buck were for him in Milan or to make himself useful quickly to Sforza. But uh, did he? do you think he thought of himself primarily as any particular kind of guy or just just a guy who was multifaceted. He didn't have a particular, didn't say, well, I'm a painter who also does engineering or I'm an engineering who also paints or I'm a scientific researcher. It was just a, just a guy who was uh, curious. Right. Well, the, it's a int very interesting question because uh, he arrived in Milan first as a musician and he was actually a very good musician, uh, according to all accounts. Uh, and he played a, he played a, um, uh, 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 well, stringed instruments and other instruments and actually designed a number of them as well. So f first he would think of himself perhaps as uh, an accomplished musician and painter and would try to train himself to be um, a, a literary scholar or someone with literary knowledge, even if he had not received a formal education in that. Uh, area. So uh, was he a humanist? That's another question. Not necessarily, but he certainly, uh, for his Last Supper, for example, uh, conveyed uh, s some humanist points of view. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, uh, you know, conveying a moral story uh, that, is, uh, that is Christian in origin, but also references other aspects of, um, of antiquity. Um, not that all humanist projects did that, but, but that was one of the foundations of that. Uh, process of humanism in the 14th century onward. So how did he think of himself? That's a good question because he, uh, he and others were, had to uh, work quickly to be accepted in the court community, especially when he, when he arrived in Milan. Um, and his training, his personal training process for that was rather intense because he had, he had to um, change his reputation to a to that of a courtier, which is which is way above, way beyond anything. Even though he had very close ties to the Medici, he and his father, and knew the Medici court very well. And in fact, the first time he visited Milan was on the behest or the behalf of uh, Lorenzo de Medici, as, in order to welcome L uh, Ludovico Sforza to uh, to Milan, um, and uh, had taken with him a very famous musician. Uh, to, to play at the court of Ludovico Sforza. So uh, Leonardo, because he was becoming a, court, a proper courtier, not, not someone who was part-time for the Medici or part-time for the Sforzas, which was common at the time, it was very rare that one would get a full-time position, um, that he had, to, he had to show that he had knowledge in lots of different areas. And, but when he... Oh, sorry. Keep, no, that, that's, I guess that's it. I guess... The word uh, that we're looking for in this context is a courtier who has multiple talents, even if we tend to today, and act, perhaps anachronistically, uh, refer to the so-called Renaissance man. Don't we? Um, but uh, yeah, courtier is what I would say. A courtier. So my understanding is when he went to Milan, uh, he hadn't had a lot of success really in anything. In Florence, up until that point, he'd got a few commissions, mostly it seems through the influence of his father, uh, uh, sort of begging and pleading and twisting a few arms with some of his clients to get some work for his uh, bastard son who was, you know, getting quite old. He was in his late 20s or 30 around about this time had a reputation already for not really being very keen on completing paintings, hadn't done any engineering to speak of, 
why you, you say that he was close to the Medici, but at, at this point, when his contemporaries like uh, Botticelli are getting commission after commission and a very famous and, and even living in the Palazzo de' Medici from time to time, very close. Leonardo seems to not be that close to the inner circle. Why do you think his talents weren't so recognised in Florence up until, you know, he leaves in early 1480s? At the Baracchio studio, it would seem that that his his talents were recognized in 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 the context of of the talents of his colleagues at the Baracchio studio, and he was at the studio quite a long time, um, the workshop, from the age of as early as perhaps thirteen or, or fourteen or fifteen, um, until uh, some ten or fifteen years later. So by fourteen ninety six or so, at least ten years after he had joined. Uh, 1496, 1497, uh, a, a good 10 years after he had joined, he, he, he had started his own studio or his own workshop. It's it, at least a, a number of people agree. We don't really know very much. We, we do, there are a number of drawings from this period of engineering projects. And indeed he was familiar with engineering projects in the Baracchio studio, but he was not, you're right. He was not producing uh, engineering work that we know about in, until he gets to Milan. And so his interest in studying and understanding engineering, however, is, is quite obvious or quite apparent in the notebooks. And in fact, uh, many years later in 1515, he would refer back to a project that he had done with the Baracchio studio on attaching a ball to the Duomo, to the Florence Cathedral um, mm -hmm. in 1470. So, um, so yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting situation for him to be in in, in Florence when um, he gets commissions mainly through the Baracchio studio and then through his father, but then has real difficulty um, uh, managing them. Um, his ambitions are very high for, for example, the adoration of the Magi. And, uh, and he produces something that would take way too long for him to finish, or at least he ran out of money or something like that, uh, and was able to get out of the commission somehow eventually which shows his connections are very strong. He also was able to get out of two lawsuits without having to appear in court. So he didn't have any trouble getting help when he needed it from very powerful people. And he was in the inner circle, certainly, of, of Florentine uh, politics, or not, po not as a politician, but within the inner circle of, of those who had power. So it's a very good question. Why, why, did, why do we only know about portraits, uh, you know, a couple of portraits and some Madonna paintings from that period. What else was going on? <laughs> it's, you know, we, we've been laughing on the show that uh, you, he's, what's he doing with himself in these times? I mean, we, we really, he doesn't seem to be producing a lot. Uh, uh, what's he doing with his time? He gets himself into trouble. There's a couple of, uh, uh, I'm not sure if these are the lawsuits you're referring to, but uh, there's some charges laid against him for his uh, homosexual activities, which he manages to uh, get out of, fortunately, because one of his co-accused was close to the Medici family and he may have benefited from that or from his father's influence or something. But he doesn't seem to uh, be doing much. What's he doing with his time? Is he just uh, sitting and pondering his navel and thinking about how to capture ripples and, and light and uh, the challenges of trying to take painting to a new level? Any idea from your studies what he's, what he's doing in his 20s that's eating up his time when he could have been working? It would, it would seem that prim his primary income was from painting at that time. And that he was, that, like I said, he had worked with the Baracchio studio. And, and, but what role he had played in painting is a, is a larger question. Um, one work we, that's very famous, of course, and Vasari, the biographer of the 16th century, mid 16th century biographer, Giorgio Vasari refers to it, is the baptism of Christ where Leonardo adds an, an angel that is so remarkably uh, uh, well-painted compared to the rest 
that uh, Vasari notes that that Verrocchio had supposedly said uh, that he would put down his brush and not return to painting after that. So it's that kind of work that he's that he's known for, and that was as late as 1496. It's believed that the painting had not an, uh, uh, had that angel added to it until several years later. The painting may have been may have been. I'm sorry, what did I say? 1496, 1476. Right. The painting was produced in 1470 or so, and yeah. When the angel was included, some would argue that Leonardo's talents had not improved to that stage until 1476. Run right. um, when it would when he would add when he added the angel. Previous paintings by him had shown number a number of sort of rookie mistakes for painters, including the the paint drying too quickly on a Madonna painting, uh, the painting of the Christ Child, for example. You can see the rippling of the paint as it as it dried way too quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and some other issues that, that we see, some other mistakes we see in page. The Annunciation, for example, has the Madonna with a with a rather long arm stretching forward to to the to the book in front of her. Um, her right arm is way too long. So, uh, does that discount all of the other incredible work that he was doing? Absolutely not. No, he was, he was certainly appreciated for being one of the best painters in Florence. So maybe he was maybe was I'm sorry maybe he was also working as a musician who knows but hmm. being so so well regarded as, as a musician one can assume he was um uh, perhaps known for a gig or two you know uh, at the time if i if i might put it so so simply but um yeah. but we look at the contracts um the, the one that his father negotiated for him with uh one of the monasteries at this point where leonardo was going to get paid with uh, a house but he had to pay for the woman's dowry. And on top of that, he was getting some firewood. And uh, it, it wasn't, he wasn't really, uh, you know, bringing in the big bucks if the terms of that contract or anything to go by. He was like to agree to terms like that when you're, particularly when your father is the lawyer drawing up the contract, you're obviously not able to pick and choose between your projects at that point. He's, it looks like he's on the bones of his ass and just happy for any work that he can, his studio can get. His studio was around like five years before he went to Milan. And there's like three unfinished paintings that we know of that came out of it. It's not like he's uh, got his choice of the, the juicy projects coming out of the Medici family, etc. Anyway, Let's move on. So he goes to Milan. Um, why do you think he goes to Milan? Is it just because he feels like he's not getting anywhere in Florence? Is it a change of scenery? Does he just think um, the the court of Ludovico Sforza might be a better hunting ground for opportunity than Florence? What, what's your take on his rationale? The reason to leave Florence might be the better, might be one of the ways of looking at this um, problem where Florence had become quite violent, actually, especially due to the Pazzi conspiracy in the late 70s mm -hmm. and, and the rise of, of um, uh, Gerolamo um, oh my God. Savonarola. Savonarola, yes, the rise of Savonarola. The, uh, the, the other violence that, that had preceded that, um, mm -hmm. the competition, frankly, of the, of the other painters in Florence as well, and, uh, and Leonardo's familiar, familiarity with uh, Milan due to him being invited first as a musician and thinking, well, uh, perhaps he could, he could take on a commission there. And he did arrange at, at that point, um, or at least soon after that, a commission for the Madonna the Rocks, uh, that he signed on a contract in 1483, uh, that he would that he would complete that painting. In in the meantime, he had already he had already been committed, of course, to the adoration of the, uh, to yes the adoration of the Magi, and had been committed to a painting of uh, of Saint Jerome, both of which he didn't finish, as we know, and both of which had understandably really really difficult administrative requirements as well that he probably was not interested or capable of dealing with so um, the other thing is he was he was attacked uh, by these by these two 
um, um, uh, accusations on him and others uh, for um, for uh, homosexual acts in uh, in Florence, and and those attacks, uh, I would think, also discouraged him from thinking about um, sticking around such such a difficult place to uh, to uh, well with all of the competition. Really, it's it's assumed that that those two attacks came from um, competing. Uh, painter studios or some or, or some oh really uh, some yeah some some competitive groups um, may may have started all you had to do was write something up on a note put it in a box the so-called men of the night would come around to the boxes each uh, you know each evening or each day and pick out the notes and then uh, and then next thing you know they they show up in the local paper which is which is called the visa. Um, and so we know about these from the visa, from the paper. Um, but, you know, in that case, uh, uh, guilty before proven guilty, if you could say it that way. Um, so, yeah. So why did he leave Florence? Well, there were, there were a number of reasons. He didn't have enough work, perhaps. He didn't have work that paid well, or he had crazy contracts, like you mentioned, uh, that just expected way too much of him. Um, and, and he found that in Milan, he, he might have had a way of making a transition into a more lucrative option. The the Madonna of the Rocks painting con, uh, contract, which we know about, is is very very nice uh, in terms of its arrangements. So um, and then of course that project would draw out for a while. It seems that ten years later the painting was was already finished and given to Ludovica Sforza, so that he could give it away as a wedding present. And then it and then the church had to get another version of it after that after 1493. So why did he leave Florence? Um, lots of good reasons to leave Florence, perhaps uh, mainly competition for the same, same, similar kind of work. So I read that he may, I think uh, Ludovico had visited Florence at some point before this. Leonardo may... They may, have, they may have crossed paths. Uh, the the Verrocchio studio designed uh, some sort of ceremonial helmet and breastplate that was given as a gift, I think, by maybe by Lorenzo Medici to Ludovico. And the paths may have crossed. Uh, Sforza may have said to him, hey, if you're ever... If you're ever looking for a gig, uh, just hit me up. Uh, you know, I, I could use a guy, I could use a young fellow like yourself, come up my way. I can't imagine it was any easier to be a practicing homosexual man in Milan at the time than it was in Florence, maybe without the Savonarola influence, although he wasn't really at the height of his powers then in Florence either. But maybe it was a you know, change of scenery, a new boss, new opportunities, whatever it was. But when he gets there, he, he seems to have, when he moved there, he, he seems to have taken everything but the kitchen sink with him, right? He, he, it wasn't like he, he was going for a couple of weeks and he was planning on coming back. He seems to have known, well, this is it. Now I'm going there for the foreseeable future. Another, yeah, another interesting uh, problem because we really don't know much about his, his uh, activities between, say, 1483 or even 1480 um, and, uh, and 1489. We know, that, we know that his activities pick up a great deal when he becomes full-time employee of the Sforza, Sforza Court in 1489. But what really happens in those years, we have, there are a few notes and drawings that indicate that he was preparing for alternative architectural projects that would that would help the city uh, cope with the, the plague because the the city was um, was suffering from the plague in 1485 we know that he helped with uh, small projects in Piombi or we not in uh, Pavia he helped with the small projects in Pavia um, he had done some some so it's if if one considers the number of years that it took for him to um, uh, um, be better better known in Milan and to be hired by the Sforza's full time. Um, and indeed, he during this period, he also competed for the architectural project to complete the Tiburio uh, or the crossing tower uh, for the Milan Cathedral. 
and uh, and lost the competition, but he was a serious competitor in that. There were, I think, there were there were a number of very good, very well known architects who had work to show for it. In other words, they had already done projects um, that one could look around Milan and, and see. In fact, the the engineers, the the architects who got the project were uh, were already known for buildings they had produced in Milan. So uh, so Leonardo with 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 little or no um, uh, record or evidence or, or um, claim to being an architect had put forth a, a, a relatively serious proposal um, right next to very well-known architects. And it shows that he was very, very comfortable with showing himself uh, in this way or promoting himself in this way, having had relatively no uh, way of showing his experience. So very impressive. And I think when we look at Milan and what he did there, uh, we should be really impressed with how he developed a name there. Yeah. By the time he gets a full-time job in the court, he's in his late thirties, nearly 40. And we, you know, he's still really yet to hit his stride. That's quite amazing for somebody who was a precocious talent at a, at a young age. So, um, Let's talk a little bit then, Matthew, about um, like, let's just talk about where he goes from there. What point do you think he really gets, starts to get recognized as a formidable talent in his life? Here he is, he's nearly 40, still trying to, you know, get a decent job. Is it when he gets this full time contract with Sforza that all of a sudden, everyone wakes up and realizes what they've got their hands on? Right. It would seem that that makes that that's a huge step forward in his career, career uh, as a, as a, as a visual artist, but also as a, in his career as an engineer, he, he proposes uh, the sculpture, the horse sculpture for uh, the monument to uh, Ludovico's father. Uh, that would be, that would not be the normal size uh, uh, bronze sculpture, and would instead require substantial engineering project, uh, you know, work to be done. Um, uh, major buildings and smelting uh, uh, factory was necessary for this for this horse that's three times the size, three times as tall as a normal horse. So, what was he thinking there, for one? And and how did he think he could just pull that off, uh, having just joined the studio? Um, it was, it's rather audacious when you think about it, that, that he's, he's not really well known as an engineer at that stage. He's no, he's, he is given engineering projects uh, by 1490 and, and in fact um, produces uh, and, and in fact is known for his architectural uh, knowledge. And the notes and drawings, the numerous notes and drawings he produced in the 1480s give us a very good ex example of how he promoted himself because he could use those and some and you can see how some of them are are for preparation rather than for uh, just personal interest and he starts to write for other people in his notebooks and he starts to write things that look like they're in proposal form we're familiar with the with the um with the vitruvian man for example the vitruvian man drawing that's for presentation that is to show someone exactly how that man would look according to the ancient uh, architect vitruvius Hmm. And and uh, so projects like that was around 1490, just after he got his job, and he already had a studio running in Milan uh, or a very well-known studio for for that Madonna of the Rocks painting that he was producing with with other uh, colleagues at the time. And he met other colleagues in Milan, other painters, and started to develop relationships there. Um, but his his engagements with the with the royal court or the mil the ducal court, I should say were so uh, were so important that he was able to get that full-time job, which is very difficult to get. And in fact, we know that Ludovico Sforza was trying to get another architect in the in the mid to mid to late eighties, even though Leonardo's right there. You know, it's like you could hear Leonardo saying, I'm right here. I, I know how to do this, really. Uh, but uh, but no, he's he's uh, being overlooked for or maybe even advised it. I don't know. But but Verrocchio, who was the favorite architect, I'm sorry, the, 
Verrocchio, the favorite sculptor for this project, was already called away at that time, and quite old, in fact, to Venice to work on, work on a sculpture there, uh, a horse monument as well. And that's what Ludovico Sforza really wanted. He really wanted Verrocchio, not a student of Verrocchio, to produce this sculpture. He could afford it. He had the, he had the bronze. And, uh, and what Leonardo proposed was magnificent. It was, it was, he had produced a maquette or a, or a model uh, that was full scale, full size. It was, it was I believe, um, I mean, you'll see different references to this. One is that he had it sculpted out of, uh, out of clay and uh, at full size and that it was used for a wedding in 1493 and wheeled into the wedding space or, or the, as the wedding is uh, 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 happening in the Milan Cathedral, uh, that there was this large clay figure. Not necessarily. It's most likely that this was a, this was painted, a horse painted on uh, canvas, for example, and on a very large scaffolding, and it was wheeled in. It was just under, it was just high enough to um, probably scrape the top of the doorway as it was being wheeled into the cathedral. So, so all of this shows that he somehow had Ludovico Sports's agreement on this colossus, you know, that, that this massive horse was going to be perfect for them. And then, of course, the French invade and, uh, and the Milanese allow them to invade, which was the daftest thing you could think of at the time. But the Milanese and French connection was so important that, that Ludovico agreed to it. Uh, I'm not sure if we want to go there just yet, but it created numerous problems for, for uh, everyone uh, in Italy, all the way down to Naples, and they had to expel the French in 1494. But to do that, the bronze that had been reserved for the horse had to be given to uh, family friends in Ferrara so that the, so that the bronze could be, made, uh, could be used to make cannon. We've already done the French invasion. We've done a big Savonarola series before this. So we've done the whole French invasion and Savonarola's, you know, uh, prophecies and all of that kind of stuff, but not as it relates to Leonardo's uh, individual adventures. Um, well, just keeping an eye on the time, thinking about um, what, what we should talk about next. Um, I mean, I... I I think we've we've sort of covered enough about these these early years and how he gets to Milan and how it takes off there. Just finishing, if we can, uh, there's a few things I want to talk to you just generally about how he's regarded and and um, how he came to be Leonardo. And and you know, as I said at the beginning of this, why we're still talking about him 500 years later. Um, one of the th questions that we've been asking ourselves on the show is what they were putting in the water in Florence at the time uh, because it's it seems to be like you didn't have to be homosexual to be a great Renaissance artist, but it kind of helped, didn't hurt. There was a number of these guys that seemed to have been uh, homosexual, which, of, of course, was you know, uh, very easy to find yourself with some sort of a death penalty. But why, is there any theory about why so many of these great artists in this period were homosexual? Is there a, is there a connection there that I'm, I'm missing between why a lot of these great artists <clears throat> um, were so inclined? I'm afraid I, I really don't know the answer to that. There, are very, there is very good research on this in recent years, in the last, say, 20, 30 years, on, um, on the uh, same-sex communities in, uh, in the early modern era and the Renaissance um, that have addressed the, is a number of these issues. And, it, and, it's, and one can apply this across the board in terms of um, uh, very well-known professionals who uh, did not discuss their own sexuality very much. And indeed, we don't really know what Leonardo's specific interests were um, in, in, in others. Although there's a lot of evidence that he um, was much more comfortable around men than around women. But, but that's, we just don't know. We don't have, a, he didn't write it. He didn't put his personal material in his notebooks 
um, as, as much as uh, we would hope he would have done. There are lots of good reasons for that. You know, the notebooks were for learning uh, about things and, and sharing information. And indeed, he knew from, his, from the attacks that he had, he, had, he had suffered in Florence, those two accusations, um, that uh, keeping his personal life uh, quite private was actually to his best, uh, his, you know, in his best interest. Um, what we can say about um, sexuality at the time, I think, gets to a broader, a broader conversation about um, uh, the rise in pro well-educated professionals at the time who chose not to have uh, families for various reasons um, and uh, may or may not have been um, sexually inclined, you know, one way or another, you know, or to same-sex relationships. But um, but that this is an intellectual group, that this is an, this is a group that's highly professional, um, and uh, and uh, there, there's there's much more to consider in that. And Leonardo is right in the middle of of those developments uh, in in the professional world of his time. So why didn't he decide on um, raising a family and you know getting married and all of that? Regardless of his, you know, sexual interests, I think that we know enough about uh, the people at the time to know that they um, could be family oriented and still have, you know, uh, different sexual interests, so or gender interests or whatever. So, so one, I, I'm not really sure that I can speak to that because I, I think that Leonardo tried to hide it, to be quite honest, and that itself probably tells you some of your answer you know why did he hide the information um but it has a lot to do with how much danger that causes people that they can end up in court they can go to jail um and uh uh he tried to stay out of trouble yeah no it's obvious that it was uh you know up until very recent times it was something that uh you, you, you know your, your, your sexual preference you didn't want to let uh out into public it was dangerous to people's careers you know up into our generation really um and particularly back then we talked a lot about you know Savonarola's issues with it and his campaigning and ranting and all of that kind of stuff just it's it's always surprising to me when i read about all of these great artists who seem obviously we don't really know a lot about their private lives at all but seem to have been homosexual got away with it and ended up being these great artists that we, you know, we, we look upon still today and just wondering, well, if there's any sort of connection there. The other thing I wanted to ask you about in terms of connections with him was the fact that he was a, a bastard. Did, did, did that help or hinder his career? It did not. Well, it did not help with um, a number of aspects of his career. For example, uh, his education, was uh, was limited, and indeed was uh, the way in which he was apprenticed, for example, to the Verrocchio studio is an indicator of how uh, how that would have been much cheaper than sending him off to a proper uh, boarding school, so or to a proper tutor, for example. The tutoring was, was also known. Uh, otherwise, there were a number of people like him who who had limited. Um, access or resources, um, but yet made very good names for themselves as uh, uh, regardless, I mean, yeah. So I, I, would, I would say that, did it limit him? It might be one of the reasons why he didn't start a family. I mean, it might be one of the reasons, I mean, I'm, I'm saying something that isn't written about much at all. I mean, this mm. idea of uh, why didn't he start a family? And, uh, and he chose a lifestyle that that indicates uh, he tried to make sure he had flexibility in his career and could move and, for example, could move to Milan if he wanted to. Um, with the support, however, he could not have done that really without the support of his father and perhaps the Medici to intervene on his behalf to get out of those contracts or at least to postpone the contracts. And then after postponing those contracts, he probably had the help of the Sforza family or at least being within the court uh he was untouchable if you know what i mean so 
Um, mm. So there's there are a lot there's a there's an interesting dynamic there about his choices. And of course, if he had been uh, born or no, not born out of wedlock, he probably would have had a lot of pressure to follow the family tradition of becoming a, a notary. Uh, may you know we may have not had Leonardo da Vinci uh, if he had been born in wedlock. So I guess. Regardless of whether or not it helped or hindered him, we are certainly lucky that he was born out of wedlock. Otherwise, we would not have, uh, we may not have him to have uh, inspired us all this time. I remember when we were um, we were last in uh, Italy uh, and France. Uh, I don't know a couple. Of, when were we there? Two twenty eighteen. We took, we did our last tour. Um, I remember at the Louvre, my um, the tour guide that we had at the Louvre was telling us the story that when the Mona Lisa was stolen, it actually took, I think she said, several hours before anyone noticed because uh, it was just hanging on a wall with a bunch of other paintings and it, 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 people were like, oh, well, what was, there was something there. What was, what was there? Uh, was that a fire hydrant? Uh, somebody somebody yeah. checked the files. There was something. <laughs> <laughs> um Oh, that was a great answer. And, you know, I, I, I've said this before on the show. I remember, um, I think it was my grade three teacher. I grew up in a little country town in country Queensland. I remember my grade three teacher at the time, was like 1977, 78, telling, uh, telling the class that Leonardo da Vinci was a Renaissance man and explaining what that meant. And even as a you know seven or eight-year-old, me going, Oh, well, you can do that. You can, you can do all sorts of things and learn about all sorts of things. And uh, it was, it, it was a really inspiring story. So I do think there's this, he is used as this beacon in so many different ways. And from what you're saying, it's, it's like a, a PR industry has built up uh, around him by these yeah. countries over the years and uh, it's worked. Can we just finish up, Matthew? Like, are there any specific innovations that Leonardo came up with in painting or engineering or his scientific research and explorations that our audience should really know about? Are there one, two or three things that you really think we should uh, focus on when we're looking at his, uh, his career, his impact? Wow, that's a that would take some thought to uh, to give you a good answer, but I can I can name two, if not three, right away. Um, one that comes up, and it's really an improvement on previous uh, uh, approaches, uh, but in a way that is so markedly uh, different and better, is sfumata or 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 the smokiness that he would add to painting, which means the buildup of of very thin layers of um, of of paint. On uh, uh, around the eyes, or around the mouth, or around the nose, to give a sense of three-dimensionality without any without any hard shift of tone or value on the face, for example. So his development of sfumato in his paintings um, is so remarkable and really stands out among uh, among his. Uh, so in terms of him being a much better painter than some of his colleagues, uh, that does come up quite a bit. And in fact, what he's doing is he's bringing a Netherlandish approach to oil painting to Italy uh, in this process of improving on sfumato model. I would say that's one innovation. Um, uh, the other, uh, for me anyway, and I'm not sure if others uh, think the same, but uh, technical drawings improved a great deal under him. The precision in, tr in technical draftsmanship was so much better for him um, than his colleagues in terms of the three-dimensionality of axonometric drawings that he had produced. And these, these are not in, these are, for Leonardo, these are partially in perspective, but they are also axonometric. In other words, you can determine the measurements at the foreground in the same way that the measurements should be the same in the background. And that means those are projections rather than perspective drawings. And that's really innovative for engineers to look at a drawing and be able to say, well, I, I can determine the proportions of what I'm about to build with the help of this, this very precise drawing. So that's innovation. Uh, the Last Supper, I would say, was so innovative. Uh, I'd, I'd say that is, that's his greatest painting. That might come as a shock to some people. 
Um, although I could bring up the, the Mona Lisa when we get to it and, and what's innovative about that painting. Um, the Last Supper is is as much a message uh, that is, uh, well, what's innovative about The Last Supper is that it is a very strong um, uh, expression of form and function in painting that you rarely see in other paintings. We, you, one can see that expression of form expressing its function, the function of the painting in, for example, Masaccio's Trinity, which is, a, which is a, about what it, uh, what it represents in a way that is conveyed in a very balanced and, and, uh, and um, a consistent manner with that of the laws of nature, for example, and of geometry. So Leonardo applied that same philosophy, that same idea in a very innovative way to the Last Supper. And if, if you need, if anyone wants evidence of that, think of all the, think of it being the iconic Last Supper since then uh, in so many ways. So anyone referring to the Last Supper just says, you know, it's gotta be that form. And why did it become that iconic? And it has everything to, everything to do with the way in which it was uh, painted and ranked. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Okay, well, we'll talk about it now. Let's okay, keep going no. with that. Yeah, so why okay, was it so breakthrough? Well, uh, very innovative because, uh, because the message of The Last Supper for, for Leonardo was to convey it as a tragedy um, and to convey it as something of a message that is in, uh, that is in loop in the, in the um, Gospel of Luke, um, as opposed to being a message from uh, Matthew, Mark, or John. The message being that there was strife at the Last Supper after Christ's comment, that, that one, of, one of the group had betrayed him, and that this would be, um, a, you know, this would be the moment when um, he has to uh, say that he's, that he's, that he, is a sacrifice. So in short, let me say this about the Last Supper. It's innovative because the message uh, is a direct statement from Luke that, uh, that there was strife at the moment of Christ's comment. Not that there was curiosity per se, not that there were people wondering, what is he talking about? But that the strife shows the emotional engagements of everyone in the, in, in the painting in a way that hadn't been seen before. And as Giorgio Fasari refers to in the, in the mid 16th century, there's a there's a veritas or a truthfulness to this to this approach to the emotions that one feels. And indeed, he expresses uh, uh, the uh, the the structure of of denial, uh, the process of denial in the painting. So the form and the function of the painting are, are quite equal in this context. For example. Thomas is pointing to heaven when, when Christ says what he says, and there's this strife in the room, uh, which is doubt, right? Uh, James Major is, has his arms open wide, and he's, and he's literally, uh, uh, obviously angry. So there's doubt, there's anger, and then there's Philip who reaches in and has his heart, hands on his chest as if to say, is it me? And that's a form of acceptance. It's very powerful, those three. And then... Um, and, and the other issue here is the perspective setup for the painting, which is pointed at Christ's right temple right here. And it goes through, one could say the vanishing point, therefore, goes through his mind, through the central part of his mind, which in, his, which in Leonardo's day is considered the location of the census communis, the common sense. And that common sense also is the location of the soul. So the soul of Christ is receiving everything in the room through that perspective diagram and, and expressing itself into the room through that perspective diagram and the way in which that perspective. So Leonardo centered the painting on Christ's soul, if you will, and portrayed the, the, the strife that's in Luke in such a way that one gets the message, the form, and the expression all in one. That's innovative. So, in its in, in in this time, trying to communicate such a multi-layered uh, story through 
a painting uh, through a mural, basically, because it's on a wall, right? That was a, that was a, a, a big innovation. Indeed. Uh, it, it, it was, uh, uh, it would have been recognized too by the court, not all aspects of it necessarily, but, but ex having to provide something that is so intellectually interesting from a humanist point of view, while also being very compelling visually, um, uh, in a way that people are familiar with at the time, um, was itself quite innovative because it had the intellectual depth, but it also made its point quite, quite explicitly uh, as well. And someone looking at it would see that it's unusual for a Last Supper because it, uh, there isn't this sort of questioning of what's just happened. There's, there's obvious strife. People are really visually upset, mm. visibly say upset, yes. And every and everyone in the painting has has a different emotion. There's something different going on, uh, which he had, he had done before, but took it to a new level in that work. I like your your point before, which I'd never considered, is that uh, you know, 500 years later, you think uh, Last Supper visual, you think of that painting. In 500 years, no one's been able to supplant it in the popular imagination. That's a that's a pretty big deal. Um, but you, you mentioned uh, you wanted to talk a little bit about the Mona Lisa. Is the Mona Lisa uh, deserving of the the place that it occupies in popular consciousness? I would think Leonardo would agree. <laughs> yes, because of the way in which uh, the Mona Lisa, the the uh, uh, Madonna del Giocondo. Um, is portrayed with regard to the background. So very often we see her, we see her cut out from the background, in fact. And indeed, the, the Prado Mona Lisa um, was damaged to the point where they painted the background out. And so for a long time, until fairly recently, there's just this black background in the Prado Mona Lisa, which is the best alternate version of the, of the Louvre Mona Lisa um, to date. And, uh, and so... What, what's, what's really happening in that painting is that the, if you look at the shadows on her, on her garments and you, and you look at the light and shadow play and the rhythm of that across, uh, across the garment, the way in which the relievo or relief factor uh, of, of her clothing uh, plays against the, the natural scenery in the background is quite interesting because you have these, uh, these curving uh, river forms and uh, sharp mountain peaks and uh, and and uh, uh, you know curves of water flow and all of the uh, active uh, energetic nature behind her and all of the uh, uh, interplay of light light and shadow with the with the natural scenery um, and, and the great distance of it this is all very Netherlandish of course um, is reflected in her own clothing and, and her own expression. So as we can also see Bernini's uh, um, Ecstasy of St. Teresa in a similar way. All of, the, all of the emotion of Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa is in the clothing, right? One often refers to the face or the hands, but really it's all in the garment, right? The clothing. So that's happening in the Mona Lisa. What's really innovative about it is that she is herself Mother Nature, that she reflects the nature behind her, that her own name uh, is reflective of Mare, the sea behind her. There are, there are two bodies of water behind her, actually. And so he, he really does overdo, to some extent, the natural, uh, the expression of the background scenery as a way of reflecting who she is. And so as a wow. Portrait, yeah. Why? Why is she uh, Mother Nature? What was it about Gioconda or his relationship with her, or the, the, that he would depict her in that way? Was it just artistic experimentation? Was he just uh, trying to be a smartass, or was he trying to depict something about her? Uh, well, I think it, I think it's a culmination of his approaches to. Um, deep natural scenery in portraits up to that point. He had, and he had done that. He had approached portraiture as a Netherlandish art, uh, art form with, with the sitter in front of a, of a, of a wonderfully 
uh, expressive distant vista of natural scenery. And so the Mona Lisa was, uh, was a continuation of those approaches over time um, to Madonnas, for example, sitting in front of windows. Uh, and then she's sitting in front of a window too. So what's different about the Mona Lisa is that he had just arrived in Florence, what, two, three years earlier, and had worked on a number of commissions, had worked on the uh, Madonna and St. Anne with St. John, and Christ Child and the Lamb paintings. There were two versions that he had worked on. And one of the first projects he had done, this might be a longer answer than you want, uh, in 1500, 1501, was to produce a cartoon that people could then come around and look at, a very large cartoon, much like the one it's lost, but much like the one that's in the National Gallery in London now, where you see uh, a wonderful sitting or a wonderful composure of Mary, St. Anne, and the Christ child engaged in a sort of not like form um, um, with, uh, with uh, a lamb or with St. John. And, uh, and uh, people could come to uh, look at that very large painting, that, that initial cartoon, not painting, I should say, the cartoon, the, the full size plan of the, of the proposed painting and see what Leonardo has been up to all this time. He's been out of Florence, right? So he, he, he comes back to Florence, a very famous Milanese painter and engineer and architect. And, uh, and what does he have to show for it? Well, he has this. Plus his painting skills have improved a great deal. And he's going to show in the Mona Lisa um, how sfumato modeling, um, uh, showing the sitter connected to her, to the rest of the world through the, her connection with nature. And this is very much his philosophy anyway. Uh, he is, he's very much in favor of uh, and his colleagues are too, showing the underlying natural forces at play in anything that's being painted to, to express the energy, the source of energy for anything, anyone being painted. Um, and he knows that he can do this, especially with the nat naturalism of the scenery behind her. Um, so yes, it's, it's an improvement on an initial technique it's, it's a way of showing a Florentine style of painting as well. He's, he's converted, his, the Milanese style is not, not like this uh, very much. In fact, they're not as concerned with, with, uh, with richly, uh, richly painted backgrounds in Milan as they had been in Florence and lighter colors in Florence. And so he's adjusting to a Florentine um, interest. Aesthetic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he didn't mention anything about her smile in all of that. Uh, he mentioned sfumato momentarily, but that's a very different uh, perspective on the painting. And we we have when we were talking about uh, his painting, his his portrait of Ginova earlier on in our series, we were talking about how relatively unusual it was to have in this era to have paintings of normal people, secular people that are looking at the viewer, like a, a three-quarter turn or a full-on portrait. Is there, is there something about the Mona Lisa that was uh, important in its day because of her directness, the directness of her pose, or was it relatively common by the time he painted that? Absolutely important. Uh, the way in which she engages the viewer by looking sort of over your shoulder, sort of to someplace over here, uh, and the focus of her of her gaze is actually quite specific, and it's very cleverly done, so that so that you become part of part of the engagement and the painting with her, uh, because she seems to be looking at you at you in your space, and uh, and the slight smile is a very uh, important and very unusual part of the painting, obviously, because uh, that makes it much less formal. It makes it much less. And, and that's, that has to be a special request or a special interest of not only Leonardo, but the patron to do that because, uh, because you would never want to make uh, an, inf you wouldn't ever want to, you wouldn't want to spend so much on, a, on an amazing portrait um, of a mother of three at that point, um, that she had had three children or was in the process of having a third child, I think. Um, uh, because this is something of a great honor to have this done for you, right? Um, so uh, 
the unusual way in which she's being portrayed is actually part of the message, I guess, that she's that she is uh, um, much more approachable um, and much more of a, um, and there's much more character there, much more personality. Yeah, you know, I, I can't think of many paintings or any other paintings. Oh, actually, maybe. Um, the Primavera by Botticelli, where there's a there's a hint of a smile on I think uh, not Spring, but whoever it is is standing over to the left of the painting. But people smiling in portraits wasn't wasn't a done thing then, was it? Everyone was looking very very. It's like photographs from the early twentieth century of my great grandparents from Poland. Like they're all like, well, no one wanted to smile in a photograph. <laughs> It, 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 was that a shocking thing to have somebody with a hint of a smile on their face in a painting? Was it like a bit racy? Were people like having to go, oh, yeah, look at that. It's quite, quite sexy. <laughs> um, maybe that was the fear. Maybe that was the concern uh, for, for the patron, but not in this case, apparently. And, uh, and so there, that this would have been for a very personal uh family space in, in the house, perhaps, um, and, uh, and shows his, there's a recent book, in fact, um, um, two, two recent books that, that look at very much at, at, her, at both her family and her husband's family at the time, and they, they were rather, rather relatively well off and could afford to not worry about their investment um, um, not being a traditional type of portrait, if I can put it that way. Um, and uh, in fact, well, yeah, it, it's, uh, we know a lot about her now that, that some of, if you've read any of the previous materials on her, say from more than say 10 years ago, um, the enigma of the Mona Lisa comes up a lot. And it's not that enigmatic necessarily what was done there. It's a very personal, direct, um, and, and work that is very much in line with Leonardo's philosophy about painting, which is that the natural world has to come alive in the work, that it has to be more real than reality itself, that it has to engage and, uh, and reflect your own engagement and your own connection with nature. And he tried to do that with all of his books. Last question then, Matthew, if uh, I could jump in my TARDIS go back and grab him as the doctor did to Van Gogh in an episode some years ago. If I could bring Leonardo uh, into 2021 when we're recording this, what do you think he would think about how we think about him today? Wow. Would he be surprised or would he go, yeah, no, (laughs) that's about right. right. Yeah, Yeah. that's about right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, I think he'd be a little surprised. I don't, I don't know if you know the line in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where the, where, they, uh, where the psychiatrist is saying, or the psychologist is saying, he's just a guy to say about the, about the, about the table box. Um, I think Leonardo would have to say the similar thing, you know, that, that uh, you know, hey, I, you know, there were a lot of talented people at the time. And although, although he would value very much people appreciating him, um, he would find it rather odd that he was that popular, I suppose. Um, he was familiar with being popular in his own time, don't get me wrong, but not that, you know, but nothing that close to uh, what happens today. You know, I, I don't I, know if that's a good question, but is that no, close? Well, yeah. I mean, I often think about this. Whenever I go to Florence and, and, and I, you know, go to visit the Duomo, and I think Brutaleschi would be like, yeah, yeah, I think that's about right. It's still one of the most famous buildings in the world right. 600 yeah. years later, and I think that's, uh, you know, I think it's deserved. Like, it, that's that's mind-boggling that something that you do will still be not just known about, but for an artist or, or an architect or a sculptor, will be revered around the world 500, 600 years after you're gone. I, I just, I, you know, I, I wonder how they would uh, cope with that realisation. And it's it's always a, seems like a great tragedy to me that we can't bring them up so they can they can see how much, you know, we, we love and value and appreciate 
the work that they did. What, what What's Leonardo up to now? What, 21 paintings that we have? If you include uh, Mundi, is it, uh, is it 21 now? Is that 20? One could say that he worked, he worked very closely on 25, I think, paintings. I would give it that number, okay. uh, including the, the very famous Lita and the Swan, which no longer survives, but is in copies and, you know, projects like that. Like not a huge output for a guy who lived a long time. He didn't die a young man like some of his contemporaries did. He, he had a good innings. There was praise for him at, in his own time, for example, um, a, a two sonnets, uh, two, well, I don't know if there were two poems written for him uh, in 1499 and published in a booklet on perspective for the Melanies or for the perspective painter. And uh, so he was, he did receive good praise in the time. Nothing like Brunelleschi received. Brunelleschi was, uh, you know, a national hero, treasure, or, or rather a Florentine hero and treasure for the city state of Florence. And, and he, he knew it. <laughs> so, in fact, he made uh, good money and then lost it, however, on investments that turned out not to work out for him. So what was Leonardo thinking of himself at the time? He had a very strong ego for for his own work and he knew he did good work um and that shows uh, but i don't think he would uh see himself as the same kind of uh, uh you know archimedean florentine uh, hero that brunelleschi was by by any measure although i could be wrong about that i mean you know it just depends on which project we're referring to i guess but leonardo right he hadn't done a lot of projects to make him assume that he deserved such he would be maybe rather bashful to receive such compliment. the fact that he's he's kind of the definition of genius and people you think genius people think einstein da vinci yeah. i don't know who else us ray and i i mean that's Fermi. really i think the yeah. three p that come to people's okay. minds <laughs> Matthew, um, I'll, I'll let you get back to your work. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, uh, shedding some light on some of those things. Um, I wanted to, uh, in our introduction, I neglected to say that not only have you written a ton of stuff about Leonardo, but I think your, mo your as I understand it, your achievement you're most proud of is that you're followed by Barack Obama on Twitter. Uh, which I mean? noticed today. And now I know that President Obama is a big fan of Leonardo. He keeps trying to get on this show. We keep right. saying, listen, dude, you it's don't have the qualifications to get on this show. Just we go somewhere else. But do, do you have any idea why he's following you on Twitter? <laughs> I, did, I didn't know he was, I, uh, but thank you for telling. Um, in fact, um, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was named after Leonardo and in fact came to London to the Science Museum to see an exhibition of, of his. And I, I, a, a, a colleague of mine walked him around the show. So that I consider a nice connection. Um, but yes, it, it, it's, uh, I'm, it is impressive, isn't it? And I like the way in which um, this, uh, this way in which he, Leonardo inspires people to, to think like him or think more creatively or take notes or be good students or He's, you know, at the end of the day, he's really a brilliant researcher who was also a fantastic painter and a pretty good engineer and draftsperson, so, um, or a very good draftsperson. So, you know, a lot, a lot can be said about how that inspiration uh, is, is, you know, to be, to be valued, um, regardless of how it might be hyped a bit, you know, in some categories, some contexts, obviously. And I appreciate, I like the fact that we're having these ca sort of casual conversations um, today uh, about Leonardo because I do I, I am asked to sort of set up regularly set up some formal statement of some sort and I, I it gets you know it's nicer to do this perhaps uh, than to do that. Excellent. Oh, our shows get pretty informal. Uh, <laughs> we're we're big believers that you should be able to talk about history and have a laugh at the same time. It's uh, it gets very dry and boring sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, what is it Thursday? I think there still at the moment, and uh, I recommend that people get hold of some of your writings, uh, particularly the the. Uh, Leonardo's crossbow was one that I enjoyed. <laughs> big crossbow. Is that what, was, what was, the, was that the full title? Leonardo's big crossbow. <laughs> yes, so the giant crossbow. Giant crossbow. Yes, yes. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much, Matthew.